Today's discussion will be presented in three sections since we are recording the session for a radio broadcast on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. Feel free to post questions and comments during the session and we'll try to get them answered online. We are particularly pleased to welcome our moderator, Jason Miller, the executive editor of Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Let me turn over the reins to Jason to begin today's discussion. Welcome to our discussion today, Connecting the Dots, Digital Authentication and Government, sponsored by NetIQ, Attachmate, and Poor Mark on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your host, Jason Miller. Our guests today are Stan Lowe, the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Information Security at the Veterans Affairs Department, Tim Rulin, the Chief Information Security Officer for the U.S. Census Bureau in the Department of Commerce, Jeff Frederick, the Senior Systems Engineer for NetIQ Corporation Federal Division, and Brent Kinston, a Principal Solutions Architect for Trivere. Gentlemen? Welcome to the program. Before we get started, let me set some context for our discussion today. Identity management certainly has come a long way in the last decade. In 2014, we celebrated, and for those of you on the on our listening audience, I used air quotes there, the 10-year anniversary of the landmark policy, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12, or HSPD-12. Without a doubt, HSPD-12 and its sister PIV cards have brought very positive impacts to how the government views identity management. But in many ways, the program also fell well short of its goals, ensuring federal workers and contractors log on to agency networks and enter, and enter federal buildings using a secure, smart identity card. Beyond the Defense Department, few other departments have succeeded in this logical access piece. And on the physical access side, well, the, the equation is even further behind many in government. And let's not even talk about the integration of logical and physical access control systems. Most agencies aren't even close yet. But with the explosion of mobile devices, new thinking about how to authenticate and authorize network access is rising, giving new life to identity, credentialing, and access management. The derived credential. It's one of the mobile-friendly approaches that is getting serious look from military and civilian agencies alike. What is a derived credential? It's a software token, usually public key infrastructure, or PKI certificate that is based on the smart card and that lives on the mobile device to make authentication and authorization easier. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology has updated its guidance to include the use of derived credentials as part of the HSPD-12 process. The Defense Department is testing out the use of this technology. Richard Hale, the DOD Chief Information Officer for Cybersecurity, told me in April that three separate pilots that DOD did showed a, the use of derived credential on a smartphone to authenticate the user back to the network, and it works very well. In fact, DOD could announce a, a formal derived credential program later this year. And momentum is building on the policy side, too. The General Services Administration and the Office of Management and Budget created a Tiger team to relook at the existing policies that govern identity management and make suggestions for updates. So our discussion today comes at the perfect time. Policy, technology, they seem to be coming together. So with that context in place, let's get our conversation started. Once again, our guests today are Tim Rulin, the Chief Information Security Officer for the Census Bureau of the Department of Commerce, Stan Lowe, the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Information Security at the Veterans Affairs Department, Jeff Frederick, a Senior Systems Engineer at NetIQ Corporation Federal Division, and Brent Kinston, a Principal Solutions Architect for Trivere. Gentlemen, let's get started. Let me turn to Tim first. The state of identity, credential, and access management within your agency. Let's just get started. What, what is Census doing around this? Well, we have um, used the PIV card, the HSPD-12 card, um, for logical access to the building, all of our buildings, and we've actually tied the um, physical access and logical access um, to the same card through our LDAP and our security system. And we're also using the PIV card so that we can use single sign-on for um, the large majority of our applications. So you're basically saying during my intro that you're one of the standouts that's not necessarily uh, fitting to my all agencies. We'd like to think so, We'd like yes. to think so. Very <laughs> good. Uh, Stan from VA, give me a sense of what's VA doing, because you guys have a, a bigger issue that we can, we'll get to in a minute. But Yeah. So, you know, the interesting, uh, the VA is one of the largest non-DOD uh, uh, non uh, cabinet level agencies out there. We we've got about you know uh, we we issue probably around four hundred thousand PIV cards. Our, we have a couple of challenges. As anybody knows, that can go and look at the um, at the uh, OMB website about the the CyberStat and VA's ability to actually implement HSPD twelve. Our main issue centers around our physicians and their ability to be able to move transition from place to place to place and and 
and uh, be able to retain the access to the Vista systems and their desktops and laptops traveling from you know exam room to exam room to exam room. We've, we're actually really, really um, interested in the soft token issue uh, because that would give them the ability to use a portable media device like a tablet or an iPhone or an Android or something like that and be able to use that to access the network via a traditional laptop or desktop. So we're actually really, uh, really, really interested in that. We're, we're running two pilots with that, uh, one for uh, a soft token and one for a, a, um, a physical token for access for our remote uh, users for the Citrix Access Gateway, which is what we use for a, uh, a remote a virtualized desktop environment. So we're hoping that once we find out how that works, that lends itself to us being able to use it internally for uh, the physicians. You talk about two separate worlds in a sense. You have the sure. VA hospitals and you have the headquarters. Right. Most of your staff is in the field. We know that. Absolutely. From a headquarters perspective, are you to that point yet where you're using the HSPD-12 card? Where does that fit in? The vast majority of the folks in, in what we term VACO, which is headquarters, is, um, yes, the vast majority of the folks are actually using their HSPD-12 cards for logical access. Uh, we're actually using them for physical access in the headquarters region uh, as well as some of the uh, – the smaller VAMCs, uh, as well as some of the regional offices, but that's not a widely implemented uh, activity now, as you, as you so uh, pointed out in your opening intro, that you know, logical and physical access are two separate things and are run, and typically run by two completely separate organizations in an agency. All right, Stan, thanks. That was great. Let me turn to Jeff now. NetIQ, you guys are seeing it from a different perspective in many ways. Your customers, maybe Census, maybe VA, maybe a host of other agencies, what are you hearing from them about physical access, logical access, and specifically as it relates to uh, HSPD-12 smart identity cards? So the customers I'm working with are generally doing well with PIV issuance. You know, a good percentage of their employees, et cetera, have PIV cards. Um, they're struggling a lot more with logical access, determining how to do it. Um, in most government agencies, the, the, there's pockets of identity management here, pockets there, and looking at it from an enterprise level, they're struggling to bring all that together. Uh, as Stan said, PAX is a completely different story virtually. No one's using a PIV card for PAX right now. It's, it's interesting because I, I've, I've been into the Pentagon several times, and, and DOD seems to have it kind of half in, half out. Sometimes you go to a door and they have to use their card. Other times it's a code. Is, that, is the physical access control side just too hard to kind of get their head around they're really working on the logical side first because that's maybe easier again air quotes i think that the pack side has a lot uh, a, lot, a lot different requirements because you have such high security areas within the federal government agencies so they don't use traditional pack systems so i think that's where the, the disconnect is and i think that's true and in fact i know that there's some work being done by gsa which we can get down the path another time about trying to say, okay, how can we bring a standard back to the physical side? Let me turn to Brent. Uh, one thing that you guys are doing with with agencies around physical and logical access, where do you see your customers heading going mm. with this? I'd like to add on to Jeff's point there that in, on the physical side, we see not only technology challenges, but policy challenges as well. When I walk into some agencies, they'll tell me, I see that you have a PIV card but it wasn't issued by our agency, so we can't trust it. So I think there's a little bit of a lag with uh, local security policy at individual agencies. But at Trivere, uh, we've been consulting for federal government uh, here in the U.S. and a few other ally governments for the past 12 years. And um, we've been very fortunate to align ourselves with some visionaries, I think, in this space. Um, we've worked with a, a lot of C-level officers at a handful of our agencies, and we're seeing that they're very challenged with this. GAO, OMB are applying great pressure, tremendous pressure, to make regular progress along the goals of HSPD-12 and, and FICAM. And um, they're not just at this point trying to become more efficient and cut costs. They're trying to create new value for their, their uh, agency workers and the, the citizen. What's interesting is years ago, and I've been covering this for what feels like a decade now, uh, there was a great example that Defense Department showed that you know if you use your smart card for logical access, you can reduce the cybersecurity. Let me stand and Tim, you both are in the cybersecurity world. That's to me at least that was a great example of, of why not do the logical access control. But there's more to it. Is there some challenges that maybe don't necessarily fit in with that idea of yes, you get better cybersecurity, but let me go to Stan first. Yeah. Um, so. We have uh, cybersecurity as a balancing act, especially in the VA, with regards to mission delivery, 
which is delivering care and benefits for America's veterans and cybersecurity. I'm often told I'm the most hated man in the VA because I'm constantly after people to you know have, increase their cybersecurity practices, and I do a lot of no buts. But the issue with you know, it's a trade off for us. And for that is, you know, I'm always going to err on the side of, of mission delivery. Um, it may be a different way of securing that, especially with the physicians. And we had the conversation earlier is how do we find a way to be able to use something other than a username and a password, which we I think we at this point, we all agree is, is not the best way to um, provide access to um, resources. But figure out a different way to um, provide those physicians, especially now in the mobile environment, because literally I think we've almost stopped buying desktops. I mean, it's all either laptops or mobile devices. And, uh, you know, the VHA is, uh, VHA has got a, a large pilot going on, large scale pilot going on with, um, with iPads and providing those to physicians to be able to access, you know, remote uh, services. And there's no way that you can use a pip card on an ipad unless you buy an extra monster you know sl- sled that this thing slides in which sort of defeats the whole purpose of being able to you know take one of these things and slide it in a physician's coat pocket and walk around with it. that's why we're really interested in new ways that allow us to be able to meet the intent of of the homeland security presidential directive but at the same time provide a better level of security than just a username and a password so Tim, you guys have a similar challenge, not, maybe not with physicians, but with the 2020 decennial count coming. Obviously, that's a huge challenge to get mobile people to logical access. Give me a sense of how you guys are looking at this, because I know drive um, credentials is a big issue for you guys, too. Right. We Actually, we are looking at drive credentials. We've got a, um, a couple of pilots going on, and we're, we're, we've actually visited other agencies, um, collaborating with NIST. We've been out to DISA. Um, to talk about what they're doing, get ideas from them, let them know what we're what we're doing. Um, the other thing is, is as Stan said, it's that balance between security and operations. We're we're moving much more to a um, BYOD, bring your own device environment at the Census Bureau. That's our goal. Um, it's the goal we we have set for the 2020 for our enumerators. Um, and actually, we're looking at doing that more and more for our headquarters employees. Um, derived credentials is the way that's going to allow us to happen. We're not buying a lot of desktops either. Um, we've now developed a virtual desktop infrastructure um, that our teleworkers can use, and everybody at Census at headquarters um, uses it. And one of the struggles that we've had is, as we virtualize the applications, um, trying to get the logical access for all of the applications that are being used on our on our infrastructure. And so. Um, our folks have put together a technical reference model for people that are purchasing, buying, building, developing applications. And if they follow that technical reference model, then we can get them so that we can use the uh, PIV card to actually use and do um, single sign-on logical access. It's interesting to hear the pilots. Uh, Jeff or Brent, let me turn to one of you guys. Let me start maybe with Brent this time. The pilots seem to, that's a common theme between census and VA. It, it, a lot of times agencies like to dip their toe in the water before they jump in. And that's just, I think, pretty typical. What are you seeing from pilots? Is that really the way that the more and more are going? Or are they even too too kind of afraid of the, the change? I'm very happy to receive this question because I'm actually working with Tim and his team at Census to run their pilot for drive credentials. And uh, they are so innovative at Census. They're thought leaders in this mobile space that they actually had us coordinating with NIST, with Hildy and Sal and others there prior to the release of the draft guidance. Once the draft SP 800-157 guidance went into draft, we began our work. And uh, now that it has been published, We've even gone and conducted a security assessment against the solution uh, according to NIST SP 800-79-2, which is currently in draft status. And we have prepared ourselves to be in a position that once that guidance is live and we can become a a certified accredited PIV derived credentials issuer, we want to turn around next day and it becomes such. Let me turn to Jeff. From your perspective, the the pilot stage versus the, the jumping in stage, what has to happen kind of for a pilot to, to kind of get going? Is it, is it a mind meld between mission and, and security? 
Um, absolutely. And, you know, the number one thing is what is the requirement? What, what problem is the customer trying to solve? And let's determine how we can solve that problem with a, with a pilot and show them that it actually works. I've been working with Brent as well as the census team with their mobile access pilot and their derived credentials pilot. And that's been very successful. We've have, they've had a lot of success there and proven that it can work. Um, again, what are the requirement? What do you need to solve? And then let's figure out the best way to do it. There's a lot of tools out there that can can solve these problems. We just have to find the right one for that agency. I really like what you said, Jeff, that it's really a, a user-facing problem. We have to look at the user experience and then drive the solution from there. For our census workers out in the field, if you can imagine they're holding a mobile device, what would it be like for their experience to remove their PIV badge from their holder, place it into the device, authenticate, pull it out of the device, put it back on so that they're badged again in front of the citizen? It's just not really... Uh, a plausible scenario. So for them to remain badged in front of the citizen, authenticate to their device using an HSPD-12 compliant mechanism and perform the interview, that's really where we're going. And as Stan said, the sled issue, I mean, DOD has shown that that sled just doesn't work. The batteries run out. There's so many problems with the idea of another device. Even one, I remember, uh, if you remember Dave Winogren from DOD, he used to have one hooked up to his BlackBerry yeah. And he just was at end sometimes yeah, because it was just it was too much. Dave and I worked together very closely <laughs> at the DoD VA interagency program office. Yes. Uh, so uh, you're, you're right about that, and the, the deal, and it affects you know the battery life, the the usability of the endpoint. So we're really, 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 really interested in. Um, a, a derived credential and a soft a derived credential in a, a soft token type format or something else that allows us to meet the intent of of the requirement, ne not necessarily having to walk around and and have the same problem that you guys had, which was you know being able to you know go into a physician and take out the the the, the PIV card and slide it into the thing and then take it back out and then go down to the next. So because because basically what happens, and I know we have to take a quick break, but they just leave it in there all the time, sure. and then that becomes a different type of it's security a, it's risk. A completely different security uh, issue. All right, well, let's take a quick break. You're listening to the panel discussion, Connecting the Dots, Digital Authentication in Government, sponsored by NetIQ, Attachmate, and Promark on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM.